the Sports Vote Campaign Podcast. Invest in sports. Hello and welcome back. Today is Sunday, February 14th, 2021, Valentine's Day. And here is the update. So a commentary on the desire to go back to the good old days. First of all, this is a human tendency to look back on the past and give it attributes that it never really had, uh, a fictional past. This is a well-documented phenomenon. Uh, I think a lot of what brought our current political situation uh, into the present, I mean, ha- how we got here is that desire to go back to the, the good old days, the 50s era, Elvis Presley and all that. Interestingly, um, if you notice the cover imagery for this podcast, it's a picture of the Elvis Cafe in Israel. It's actually on a, um, on a route between two of the major cities. Uh, it's, uh, that just shows you how far that culture spread. And keep in mind that Israel is a country that's less than 100 years old. It's born in the 20th century. So I get the, the feeling and Whether you want to believe me or not, I understand the appeal. I grew up uh, in the 80s. That was my teenage years. Um, You know, my generation tends to look back favorably on that period of time. But if you study it closer, you'll see that there was a lot of trouble. You know, the the threat of constant threat of nuclear war. uh, AIDS really was out of control. Um, So this is a, a human tendency to create a fictional past. Uh, and then, uh, you know, give it a nostalgic halo, so to speak. And that's that's why we got here to a great degree. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. It's just an observation. And I have some of the same feelings looking back towards the 80s. But the reality is there's, you know, there's a song about this. I can't remember who put this out, that the good old days are uh, not what they seem and tomorrow's not as bad as it seems. Uh, that's very true. So that nostalgia, while understandable, uh, is it's not actionable. You can't get back. You can't go backwards in time. You have to go from where you are. So uh, just to kind of a, a thought on that. Bottom line, I get it. I understand. Um, I understand the emotion and the sentiment, and I share it to a great degree. And I can even understand the '50s era. Um, you know, the, the space age, uh, beginning of the space age. And if you just go back to all black and white films from that period and even commercials from that period, there is something magical about that. But there's no way to get from here to there. You have to go from here forward. Uh, sports performance is an asset. So I'm gonna, this is going to become a, a more frequent reminder talking point. Um, the gambling operators are essentially poaching that asset. That's our claim, that gambling is poaching sports performance rather than providing a vehicle to invest in sports performance. Your money sends spending sends signals. A said this many years ago. This is probably five, six years ago, and I really didn't think about it at the time. This was near the restart of um, of ASM, uh, the second round. And he said that the uh, you know, your money spend is a signal. That's very true. Uh, and I would say it's it's more true now than it's ever been. So what you put your funding towards is what you're encouraging in the broader marketplace. So just keep that in mind. Venice, California versus Costa Rica. So there was a highway. I don't remember the number of it that ran um uh, through San Jose, uh, actually through Escazú. And I would often ride down that highway, and on the left side you would see condominiums and home, you know, multi-hundred-thousand-dollar condominiums and very expensive homes. And then on the opposite side you would see uh, shanties basically about to fall down the ravine. And the dividing line was the highway. Um, it was it was the most stark uh gap between the rich and the poor that I'd ever seen with my own eyes to that point. That's until Venice, California. So uh, you take the highway away and you increase the the numbers, 
you know, in, in terms of the pricing of the real estate. And that's what you have in Venice. So in Costa Rica, you had expatriates and political types and business people living in these expensive homes surrounded by Constantino wire fencing and 24-hour guards. I had to live uh, in a neighborhood with a 24-hour guard. There was an armed guard 24 hours a day uh, in my uh, complex where there were, I think, six houses. If it wasn't for that, uh, if you didn't have that, you would you would be a victim of crime. So uh, that's... That's how that works down there. And then here uh, in Venice, you have these multi-million dollar, very small houses, and you have homeless people uh, you know, living directly in front of them. So it's, it's kind of incredible. It's really got to be fixed. This is, again, uh, this is just the leading edge of the problem. The problem is everywhere, but this is just where it shows itself most vividly. So one of the projects that I managed that actually contributed a, 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 my portion of the capital side of this business, which is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars out of pocket for me, by the way, um, was in the 2000, uh, 2000 period from 2001 through 2006, I would say it was, 2007, uh, was the marketing of a, an educational system to trade the stock market. And... It was based upon the news. Uh, most importantly, it was based upon how the public perceived the news. So the theory behind this, and it was very successful, was that the only sane trading system in the marketplace, not looking at technicals, none of that, was analyzing the emotional response that the public would have to the news. And that was before the social media age, which is turn this into, uh, it's hyper extended on that concept. I, I can only imagine what that system would be like now in the age of social media where p the public isn't really distinguishing between reputable news and blogs that are put up by somebody in their basement. Um, it's, it's, the point I'm making here is that news drives everything. Uh, even more now than ever, and then, and now that you have social media in this uh, present age, it's just, I think it's made everything drastically worse in terms of uh, not really being able to determine where value really lies and just the crowd following one another around and, and making asset bubbles all over the place. It's a real mess, um, in my opinion, anyway. So if Bitcoin and crypto are fine, is specifically the Bitcoin versus um, XRP, the, you know, the, that battle, BTC versus XRP, BTC good, XRP bad, makes no sense whatsoever. There are thousands upon thousands of cryptocurrencies, um, but I think the leading edge of this argument is between XRP and, uh, and BTC. It, it just doesn't make any sense, but look. If the market and the regulators are going to allow this stuff to grow, which, again, is an existential, I will say this, and I've said it for pretty much the whole time that crypto has existed, that this is an existential threat to the nation-state structures. <clears throat> That's what it is. Uh, it's it's a libertarian, it's, its ethos is libertarianism, and it's not a pro-system case. If that's allowed to survive and thrive, which looks more and more like the case every single day, and this is going to be looked back upon uh, when the inevitable crash comes, and it will, or the U.S. dollar and other nation-state currencies lose their primacy, and they wonder why, you can go right back to this. So that's it's it's a chaos play. Okay, it's a cha it's a chaos play is what it is. But if the SEC and the CFTC and the other national regulators, the UK uh, regulators and so forth, are fine with crypto, in spite of the fact that it's based on absolutely nothing, um, it is a baseless asset, there's no asset backing whatsoever to it, and it requires electricity to survive. Anybody who uh, wants to look this up, look up the Carrington event. If we have one of those, then poof, there goes your crypto. Uh, and it has happened before, so don't say that it can't happen, because if it's happened once, it can happen again. Um, if that's okay, if a if a construct of hexadecimal numbers, in the case of uh, Bitcoin, as of this writing, has been hyped up to 50,000 uh, per <laughs> string of, it's just, 
it's humorous to me because it's it's Dutch tulip mania all over again. But okay, so you want to pay fifty thousand dollars for a string of crypto numbers that waves up and down sometimes ten percent in one day. If that's all fine and the regulators are fine with that, which they are in the case of Bitcoin and and, and BTC, and they're not in the case of uh, XRP. So I, how how is this? All right, so one string of numbers is fine, another string of numbers is not fine. Yeah, go ahead and sell that to somebody that have a brain, but that's okay. Uh, if that's the current regulatory environment, then what we have is much greater than that because sports performance does not disappear when the power goes out. I'll just, that's, we can start there. There's a whole lot more, but we can start with that. And while the regulators are allowing this uh, crypto to grow, which you can buy at your local cash advance shop and, Unfortunately, um, I bet the numbers would show that uh, a lot of that is being sold through those venues to people who have no business uh, buying that. They're buying it right next to their lottery tickets. And then you have cases like uh, Venice, California, where, you know, there's people sleeping on in on the street right in front of a multi-million dollar house. You want to keep that going, then keep right on supporting that kind of garbage because that's where it's all headed. Um all of this stuff going on, uh, Elon claiming to be moving to Texas from California, I mean, you know, I'll just point out that there'd be no Elon Musk if it wasn't for California. So uh, people forget quickly where where they're, uh, where they got their start, I guess. Uh, this is all just a tax dodge. Um, that's what it's about. Fine, you know, uh, go ahead and do that. That's your right. But don't sell it to me as, as something wonderful, because in my book, you're basically stabbing the people in the back where you, you got your the thrust of your, uh, uh, you know, how you got where you got, basically. Uh, it's forgetting your roots. Uh, but all of this kind of stuff, crypto, uh, the last political uh, administration and all this upheaval, and, and it's all about breaking the system apart because people think that it isn't working in the middle, which it's not. I I totally agree with this. Um, it is not working, and it hasn't been for at least the last 20 years. It really started about 40 years ago, but it's been really bad for the last 10 to 20 years. But this is not how you fix it. You you don't throw all of it in the trash uh, in, and break it all to pieces. You work within the ground, the bounds of what you have to make it better. But these are all symptoms. The point I'm trying to make here is that these are all symptoms of a problem and not the actual problem. Esports is a go. Uh, so we're, um, Alper is okay with this. So we're now going to put parameters around this. This will be a much less uh, difficult thing to find because esports leagues don't require all of the physical stuff. We were getting uh, fouled up with. Um, finding a physical league because of COVID-19. Uh, it's hard enough for the for the professional leagues to manage and uh, trying to sell a new idea like this in the current environment where you need a physical, you know. Actually, to be honest, I didn't really think about this part of it when I first put the idea together, but it makes sense that if they barely trust the NBA, for example, what are the chances that we can convince them as a nobody from nowhere uh, to give us, you know, to allow us to put together a, a football or basketball league, and especially one with celebrities in it. So esports, totally different world. I'm not talking about esports that's combined with physical sports, you know, where you have like a mirror product. I'm talking about purely uh, esports by itself, where that's just computers and uh, computer networks and all of that so sort of thing. Now, we will have to be more um, careful with governance. Uh, I've been in the computer business all my life, um, all my working life for sure, the last more than 30 years. And it's going to have to be um, careful because the potential for, for manipulation. And the last thing that we want is to get this one example out there and then it be hit with some sort of scandal. So um, it will require more careful um, planning and vetting and all of that to pull it off, but I think the universe becomes much, much larger uh, because of this. And again, all we need is one story, one legitimate story, obviously without a scandal, uh, to make all of it work together. So the real battle that I see uh, in, in society, in culture, in the financial markets, in our politics, is the battle of anarchy versus order, okay? Anarchy versus order. That's the real battle. 
we are on the side of order, okay? Order. It's, it's, that's, you, you only have two, two choices to, in, in this, in this, uh, you only have two choices. There's not three choices. You're either on the side of anarchy or you're on the side of order. We're on the side of order. Let me be very clear about that. So the NBA is starting to promote investment. Uh, they want people to learn how to invest. That's a very interesting development. Uh, it's very early. Uh, they're directing people towards the existing financial markets. I think the danger here is to watch that they don't try to conflate gambling bets with investing. That's that's something Alper addressed uh, many years ago, that that march was on to try to confuse the public, that everything is the same, that gambling and investing are the same. And I think that's the uh, the danger here as well. So we need to keep an eye on this. Gambling operators are um, also, the. I said in the last uh, podcast and previous ones, that the uh, everybody's a loser, that you know gambling is for losers. Uh, I'm going to add to that list even the operators at this point. So uh, in the last podcast, I, I said that everybody but the operators are the losers. Now even the operators are the losers. Nobody's making a profit these days in the gambling markets. Find one example of reported numbers where there's a profit. You're not going to find it. It doesn't exist. Go ahead and look for it and find it. And if you find it, send it to support at as at allsportsmarket.com and I'll post it. Okay, so Donald Trump is a TV show guy. Okay, let's be very clear about something. Sean Penn said something uh, recently which is absolutely accurate. The reason that we got uh, Trump is because of the celebrity-obsessed culture. Um, these things are not what you think, Okay. They're just not, okay? I, I live in this environment, and it's not what you think it is, okay? Don't don't put these people up on a pedestal. It's it's absolutely wrong, okay? It's wrong. They're, they're people just like you and I. Uh, it's just a job. And in the case of show business, uh, which I think has been really diluted by the YouTube generation and all of this, you know, once upon a time becoming a celebrity like Johnny Carson required required something you know you had you, the machinery uh, would vet out all of the nonsense and only really the top talented people would end up in these places of public acclaim that's all gone okay now you have everybody and their mother thinks they're a, a, a tv show person because they can put up a video on youtube um, we ended up in this because of that obsession with celebrity culture which is really totally ridiculous now i say that having come from the other side of it i can remember uh, thinking about this in a special way, you know, looking at all of the tabloid magazine racks and thinking, my goodness, what is it like to be that person and all that? I mean, we we in this country really make an excessively big deal out of that, uh, much more than any other place in the world. And it's come back to bite us. Um, believe me, you're misplacing your attention if, uh, in this stuff. It's It's not worth this kind of focus. It's not worth this kind of a claim. It's just a job, folks. Okay? It's just a job. And some people are better at that job than others. Uh, movies and TV shows are just constructs, uh, no different than building, a, you know, something in your, you know, building a, a kid's playhouse in your backyard. Okay? It's just a construct. The thing about Hollywood is, is they've gotten really good at the marketing and PR side of this. Uh, really, really good at it to make to make it seem like something beyond what it really is. So that's how we got here. Celebrity obsessed culture is how we got here, and it's not how we're going to get out. We've got people have got to snap out of it. They've got to got to get back to the real stuff, the stuff that really matters. And also, we're a very impatient society. Okay, so what has happened? The reason the economy um, took off like it did in the last few years. Now, look, if you're honest, if you're honest and you take a look at the timeline, the recovery that uh, Trump inherited was not his. It, it was already well underway when he took the reins. This machine takes a long time to turn the direction. Uh, it was already headed up uh, before he got it. But what happened was he took the, it's like an engine governor. He took the governor off and that caused it to spin up even faster, okay, like an engine with a flywheel. The problem is, is that it, when you do that, sure, you get, you know, it's like taking a hit off a crack pipe. You, you get a short, really strong boost, but generally you blow something up, okay? That's, what you're, that's what's happened to us, okay? That's what is happening to us. Now, the reason you haven't seen a total economic meltdown 
beyond what you did uh, in 2008 is that they have been printing money like crazy. I mean, they have doubled the money supply, roughly doubled the money supply uh, in the last few years, especially in the last year or so with the COVID-19. Now, they really don't have a choice, okay? If they don't do this, then, then all bets are off. But something's got to soak up all this liquidity and something has to be, there has to be a real foundation put beneath all of this fictional uh, money, money. Well, it's not fictional. They really did print it up and most of it ends up in the stock market. That's why you see the stock market numbers up so high. But we've got to put a floor underneath this or we're going to face catastrophe. It's, it's guaranteed to happen. Um, you can get away with this in a system this large, especially when you have your money all over the world, propagated all over the world through do dollarization. But something needs to come in underneath all of this. And it's not going to be Bitcoin and it's not going to be gambling that's going to do it. I mean, Bitcoin has no foundation. There is there's nothing beneath it at all. There needs to be real assets beneath this or you're going to have catastrophe. There is no more left, right? Um, I agree with this also sentiment that there is no more left-right politics. It's politics of the haves and the have-nots. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, and, and the only way you're going to solve that, again, the only reason that extreme movements get traction is because people are suffering from something. And in this modern age, um, what that is is lack of real opportunity in the middle. Uh, it's just not there. Uh, and there's no clear pathway to it. It is our belief that that pathway is sports and investing in sports because sports is so pervasive, as I've said over and again. And that's uh, investing in sports performance is the quickest way to get there. Um, you know, and that's our proposition. And that's that's a product that will be accessible to anybody er, anywhere in the world, both from the vendor side and from the uh, from the from the customer side. It's a whole new ecosystem, the new sports economy. That's that's the whole concept behind that, which we've been saying for more than a decade. The Roaring Twenties. Okay, the Roaring Twenties are not going to be based on gambling. They're going to be based on investing. Look at the history. Look at what happened in, in the... We're, we're in a really interesting period. I think it is possible to uh, to have a, a re rebirth of this uh, Roaring Twenties concept. You know, I think that that is possible. I think there is a lot of pent-up demand. I, I do think all those things are true. It was also the result of, well, there's a lot of factors, but it was coming off of the back of a pandemic. We're, we're literally repeating something that happened 100 years ago almost exactly. That future is not going to be based upon gambling. It's not going to be based upon crypto, and it's not going to be based on cannabis. And it's not going to be based on Reddit mobs, uh, you know, moving around the markets and hyping stocks up. None of that is going to build a foundation, okay? We're missing the foundation. We need infrastructure, okay? We need new infrastructure. Uh, the Biden administration is going to put forth an infrastructure plan, which Trump promised and never delivered. We need that. We need new roads, bridges. Uh, we need that stuff for sure. It's we're way behind on that. Uh, internet infrastructure so that everybody has access to high-speed internet, that kind of thing. That's That's all part of it. But... If you're trying to tell me that the future is going to be built upon a bunch of stoned out gambling, uh, sports gambling and crypto gambling, people moving around the markets through Reddit mobs. I mean, does that even pass the the initial sniff test? Because it doesn't in my book. I mean, you may have short term periods of what appears to be prosperity in pockets, very small pockets, by the way, <laughs> of the of the economy. But uh, once again, this is just shortcut, 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 which will lead to disaster. There's a new fan-controlled football league uh, that's being ginned up. I think that's very interesting. I think that that is, uh, that is going to... I think that's sending a signal, actually, that uh, we, we need to step into this space and say, okay, you want a fan-controlled league? We have the, we've been working on this for more than 10 years. Take a look the real number is 15 years i would say prior to that we were we were developing the the initial market beta and really didn't know what was happening even with what we were doing i would say the last 15 years have been um the the full understanding of what this is capable of so fan controlled football league to me that's a market signal saying it's time to step up and talk about what you have um, the market is obviously seeking new new things, some place to build new opportunity. That's why you're seeing 
uh, spikes in crypto, you're seeing spikes in cannabis, you're seeing spikes in gambling, but these these do not make for a firm foundation. There's there's no case of that. Show me an economy where any of these things has built a foundation. Show me where cannabis has built a foundation, a reliable foundation. Show me where crypto has built a reliable foundation. Show me where gambling has built a reliable foundation or hyping up a stock like GameStop through just mass force of, of uh, anonymous chat boards. I mean, that that's just, it's just gaming. It's just playing games with everything. It's not building anything. Okay, so a couple a couple final comments here um, regarding the SEC case, which is still pending. Um, I just like to put a note out there to those of you who are rooting for a negative outcome. First of all, if you claim to be um, a ASM stakeholder, I'm going to call bullshit on that because it, you're acting against your own interest if you're rooting for something negative to happen there. Um, that's and and I'd like to also say that you are never going to get any money out of this. Uh, all you were going to end up doing was wrecking everything because the recovery was going to go to the SEC. That's the whole subject of the uh, of the Supreme Court cases that have been affecting the SEC recently. And it's something I brought up a long time ago. Wait, wait a second. So so if there's a if there's a, a judgment, that money goes to the SEC as a fine and they keep it. So. If if that's what you were thinking, if you were thinking that they were going to recover money from us and then you're going to get it back, they were going to put it in their own pockets. So you didn't help yourself. You didn't help ASM. So A, you're not invested in it at all. Okay, you have no claims and you're just uh, trying to hurt us because maybe you work for Fantex or maybe you work for DraftKings. Maybe you're part of the gambling faction. I wouldn't put it at this point in time. It's totally not out of the question. But if you thought you were actually going to get something back, you're a fool because that wasn't going to happen. Okay, that was never going to happen. Um, and as far as Leon goes, that's pending in state and federal court. And we're actually looking at counterclaims because I believe we've got some. We've never chased that down before. This is going to be tied up for a very long time. And if you think that by preventing me from ever being able to submit evidence or, ha or, or present witnesses or cross-examine witnesses, or have a trial in front of a jury. None of that ever happened. None of that. If you think that that's okay, then I've got some words for you. Listen to me carefully. Burn in hell. Okay? Got it? Burn in hell. That's not justice. Okay? There was no trial. There was no trial. It never happened. I was aggressively prevented from from defending us, defending myself, presenting witnesses, presenting evidence, cross-examining witnesses, all of that. None of that was allowed. None. Zero. Okay? So, if you think that that's fair play, burn in hell. That's what I have to say to you. And if you're going to post things in the public domain, and by the way, be very careful. Okay? Multi-billion dollar lawsuits going on. The, w the winds, as I said, Section 230, the winds are changing very drastically right now. And trying to change things after the fact. See, we record all this stuff. So if you change it, it's not going to remove your past liabilities. Okay, so that's a false, that's a false uh, notion if that's what you think is happening. We have many years to pursue these claims. Okay, we have, the statute of limitations is years on this. So waking up and deciding, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to change my role or I'm going to delete a few. That's not going to work. Okay. That's not going to work. You're going to be responsible for what you've done, okay? You're going to be responsible for what you've done. So if you're going to post things, if you're going to post things, post all of it, okay? Don't clip out of it. Don't take it out of context. That's a lie, okay? That's a lie. Got it? That's a lie. If you don't present everything, you're nothing but a liar, all right? And finally, you're going to get what's coming to you, okay? Justice, I agree, justice does take a while. It does take a while, but it happens eventually. And uh, you'll get what's coming to you or the lack of what's coming to you. That's That will happen. It's just a matter of when. Um, unfortunately, it does take a while. <laughs> but uh, if you're on the other side of this and you're presenting half-truths and all this, then you're working for the darkness and you deserve exactly what you get. And I want to say something specifically. Uh, I want to send out a personal thank you to Brett Decker and his father and everybody else. There's a whole bunch of you. And look, 
I I don't ask I specifically to Brett because I think it's totally unfair. I have told Brett, and he will tell you the same thing many months ago, maybe even more than a year ago, uh, not to contribute anything else. Okay, so Brett's not holding this up. Okay, neither is his dad and and a whole bunch of other people who are quietly behind the scenes doing what they can to help us move this along. Um, if it wasn't for him specifically and his dad, there would be no ASM here, okay, at the present time. Let me tell you what's paying for most of ASM right now. Me, okay, me. I'm paying for it. I'm the one that's paying for the personal costs of this, not through donations, not through raising. Those efforts produce almost nothing at this point not even enough to pay for domain renewals, okay? I'm the one holding this up personally. That's who's paying for it. Not Brett, nobody else, okay? I'm paying for it. Just like I did before everybody, anybody even heard the name All Sports Market, okay? Back in the early 2000s, the early 2000s, I financed this from my income from other sources before anybody ever heard of it, okay? So... I'm back to paying for it out of my own pocket again. That's where the money's coming from. So, uh, all the liars and, and screwballs out there, you'll get your day. 43 scarlet letters in this life and the next. Anybody who's paying attention is going to know exactly what I'm saying. I just want to put this on the record. 43 scarlet letters in this life and the next for political expediency. Count on it. So see the show notes for any particular details related to this episode, along with links uh, to all of our public resources and anything that we think is relevant. Uh, please refer it if you think it's interesting or that somebody should know or maybe you know wants an update on what's going on. Um, like it if you like it. Review it if you want to. Subscribe to it if you want to be notified. Thank you very much for your time, and please stay safe with your friends and your family. Bye now.